we're going to um, start the meeting. So thank you, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, it's been a little bit of a challenge, <laughs> not only with the meeting set up, but I know for everyone um, coming in this morning with um, the weather. Unfortunately, we did have a couple of people who were intending to join in person but weren't able to. Um, but I believe that they are on Zoom. So thank you to the COVID-19 vaccine subcommittee members for attending. And then also thank you to our vaccine advisory committee members um, who are joining us today as well. This is a joint meeting um, of two um, of the committees. Uh, the committees. So I just wanted to kick it off um, by thanking everyone and um, wanted to quickly turn it over to Dr. Alexander Scott for any opening remarks. Thank you. Just wanted to say good morning to everyone. Thank you for weathering the weather and um, give appreciation to Trisha and the entire team uh, for strong work, continuing to engage you all for input as we go, particularly knowing we are in this phase of the vaccination campaign that is driven by uh, key public health um, policies that are effective. Uh, we want to continue to stay in front of that with your input. So we look forward to a great meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director. Um, so to kick it off this morning, to review the agenda, um, we have our guiding principles. Um, we'll talk uh, very briefly, um, provide some information on our current vaccine um, administration data. Um, we'll discuss our equity and vaccine distribution. Um, we'll provide an update on booster implementation. As we know, um, FDA just recently authorized additional booster um, vaccines and then um, get into a deeper discussion about our planning for implementation of the Pfizer vaccine for ages 5 through 11. And then um, if time permits, we'll open it up to public comment. So um, as of usual, our principles guide us through um, our continued efforts to um, implement vaccines across the state. Um, and then we all know safety, minimize morbidity, efficient distribution access, and then overarching um, everything is our equity. So jumping right into the, on the data, I am pleased to announce, and I'm sure um, many of you may have seen this already um, in the media, I think it went out maybe yesterday, but um, as of um, today, all um, 18, all those 18 and over in Rhode Island, 90% of all 18 um, and over have been partially, at least partially vaccinated. That is tremendous. And 82% are fully vaccinated. Um, so thank you all um, for the work you're doing. Thank you to all of our partners across the state um, getting us um, to these fantastic numbers. As we can see, we continue um, to increase. Um, so we have not stagnated. We continue um, slow, but steady, um, increase our vaccination coverage rate. And then if you look at the denominator of all Rhode Islanders, um, the number is 78% are partially vaccinated and 71% are fully vaccinated. So excellent progress and thank you all for helping us get there. So I am going to turn um, a few slides over to um, Kaylin Arrington. Kayla. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Kaylin Arrington, and I uh, work within the Hide and Seek Communities work stream here at RIDO. Um, and this slide uh, talks about the, the gap uh, and how we've closed it in BIPOC vaccinations. And it's really been a collective effort um, among RIDO, our community partners, and uh, leaders and, and residents as well. Um, so among all Rhode Islanders, weekly rate rates of the vaccine were highest among white and Alaska Native populations through April. However, since May, weekly rates have been higher among Latino um, and Black populations. So the uptick among Latino and Black populations has really increased um, at a rate that's higher than, than white uh, Rhode Islanders and uh, American Indian or Alaska Native Rhode Islanders. So. Um, that is great news that BIPOC uh, or Latino and Black populations um, feel comfortable getting the vaccine and have been getting the vaccine at these rates. So there has been a slower uptake among um, younger ages in, in certain communities, including HDCs, um, or we expect that there will be uh, 
a slower uptake in 5 to 11 um, based on similar trends that we've seen with 12 to 15 um, and also historic rates uh, that we've seen when we first were rolling out with adults. Um, however, in Central Falls and Providence, um, adults are um, have higher vaccine uptake rates and are now somewhere in the middle. So we expect to see those trends with uh, 12 to 15 and then with 5 to 11 as well. So it will be slower, um, but all of these equity efforts, uh, we do expect them to close that gap. Um, and then Dr. Goodell and Brown University conducted an analysis of all of our pop-up clinics. Um, and it was found that uh, we've had over 700 clinics, uh, pop-up clinics um, in over 700 locations from April to October. Um, and they've been held at locations that are readily accessible to nearly all major cold spots. Um, so a cold spot is those geographic regions where the number of people uh, who received a first dose of vaccine is lower than we would be than would be expected. Um, and so this analysis mapped out, like I said, those 700 community vaccine clinics since April um, and identified areas where residents could have walked to a clinic in 15 minutes or less. Um, and that is just what um, what uh, the literature typically says is, is geographic access. So that's how it's defined. And then they overlaid these areas um, over a map of vaccine cold spots and uh, Access to these community clinics is generally good, with most residents living within a 15-minute walk or less. Um, and in a few cold spots with poor access, pharmacy locations were nearby. Um, so recent vaccine ops have resulted in easy walk-up access to community-based clinics uh, across Rhode Island. And we really do utilize that data when we are picking locations for uh, vaccine pop-up clinics in high-density communities. Um, so we are really proud of all of the equity work that we've done and, again, could not have done it without our community partners, um, leaders, and um, you know, local residents out there getting the word out and doing the work. Um, we still have a, a little bit to go um, and we'll continue to prioritize equity in, in all of our vaccine distributions, especially uh, with these changes that have been occurring. I want to give an opportunity um, if there are any questions, comments, observations um, with any of the equity work that's been happening. Give a thumbs up from Dr. Raha. <laughs> uh, yeah, Tom Blood. So, are, are the pop up, the 700 pop up clinics uh, one offs or are they uh, upstanding places that are there for a uh, prolonged period? That is a great question. Most of them have had at least um, two clinics. Um, so historically, that was first dose and second dose. But there are some pop-up clinics that are reoccurring um, weekly, bi-weekly, a couple of times a week. Um, so 700 certainly is not the number of pop-up uh, clinics that were held. Um, it's just the number of different locations we've had. So great, great location, great question, and yet really does vary. But the vast majority, there have been more than one uh, clinic, and in several cases, uh, there have been several clinics. Thank you, Kaylin. Okay, so um, we're going to move into um, a booster update. All right. <laughs> Um, so, um, as many of us know, um, ECIP recently approved the Moderna and Johnson Johnson um, vaccine for a booster dose. Uh, the Moderna models, in terms of eligibility and when um, people are eligible for the vaccine, the Moderna requirements uh, model the Pfizer in terms of um, those who are 65 years and older living in um, long term care, um, congregate settings, and those 18 and older. Um, who are um, have underlying medical conditions or live or work um, in settings that put them at high risk. Um, and then for the J, and then it's six months after primary dose. And then for J and J, it's anyone 18 and older 
um, with no, um, you know, criteria after that other than after two months, two months after um, the, the single dose. And so just to give you a sense um, of the number of people that we're talking about, at least in Rhode Island, so um, number of people that were eligible um, for the Moderna booster uh, as of 10 18 was around 73,000 individuals. And then for the J, uh, I'm sorry, not the 65 and older. And then for those who are 18 and older um, who live in long term care, underlying conditions, or higher settings, it's around 38,000 individuals. For the J&J, &J, um, it's around 50,000 people eligible as of 10 18. And we have been conducting um, messaging, um, direct outreach to people, um, letting them know that they may be eligible for a booster dose. Um, it's also important to um, point out that CDC is allowing for mixing and matching. Um, that's something that the FDA covered and that ACIP covered and felt that it was um, important because people may even prefer um, to receive a different, different vaccine and all indications um, show that um, the immunity boost that's provided is just as sufficient and that there are some people who may not recall or uh, may have lost a record. And so um, mixing matching is okay. Um, oh, um, it, it really, the, the way that we think about it is whatever you receive your primary series is how you determine your eligibility and the timing. And then from there, you can choose, um, if, you, if you want to choose the vaccine that you receive for your so as far as booster implementation, what is our what is our uptake? You know, what does it look like? So as of 10:22, as of Friday, roughly 47,000 doses beyond primary series. That's how we're categorizing boosters as doses beyond primary series, um, because there are um, some people um, that the ACIP recommended um, people who um, those with um, who are immunocompromised were recommended to get a third dose, and that's also a dose beyond primary series. So that's how we're capturing it. We can't distinguish when we see a third dose in um, our immunization registry and right here. We don't have the background of for, like any underlying conditions or knowing why people. So we basically capture it as dose beyond primary series. So as of 1022, around 47,000 doses have been administered. And then 38,000 have been administered since um, September 24th. So on September 24th is when um, the Pfizer booster, the booster um, recommendation came out. Um, demand has been strong. Um, we didn't see a, um, um, a, a dramatic increase, but the numbers have been strong and consistent. Uh, we're, we're calling it a walk, not a run. Um, people didn't come out in droves, but they've been steadily coming out to receive their booster vaccine. Um, you can see the breakdown by vaccine type, of course, uh, because Pfizer recommendation came out prior. Um, the vast majority of Booster doses have been Pfizer, but as you can see in 1021, I'm, I'm sorry, 1019 to 21, we're starting to see a little bit of an increase um, there or a decrease, but um, and then with the Moderna coming on board. I think the first, I think the day that Moderna was announced, uh, we saw about 2,000 administrations for Moderna booster. So um, people are getting the message. We're trying to make sure that everyone's aware that they're eligible. Um, and then you can see um, on the chart to your right, um, on 1014 is when we actually started the direct outreach messaging. So text messaging, email, letting people know that they may be eligible uh, for a booster. And then the age breakdown, as I think you would imagine, the majority of people who are getting the booster dose are 65 and older at 72% and then 18 to 64, 28%. So we'll continue to message that to folks. Um, we recognize that it is a confusing message with the mix and match. Um, people want to you know, make sure that they're getting the right one. We are advising people if they have questions about which boost dose they should get, whether it should be Pfizer, Moderna, or J&J, that they talk to their healthcare provider. Any questions about boosters? We jump into, I think, 5 and 11 goes next. Check. So are the primary care practices doing the boosters? Do they have the vaccine at all? Oh, yeah, do you want to start? So, yeah, the question from Joan is whether or not um, primary care providers are administering vaccine for booster doses. We do have, um, I have, well, I think this slide I have is pediatric. But we do have a fair number of um, medical homes that are administering. Um, the, the largest um, majority of people are going to pharmacy. 
So almost across every um, aspect of this response, pharmacy has been kind of the highest throughput, um, but we do have some medical providers who have the vaccine. And we're, we're continuing to onboard folks as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about provider network. Okay. So moving on. Great. Okay, so five to 11. So um, we'll talk a bit about access and engagement, but just to preface that um, FDA did meet yesterday. I'm not sure if everybody saw that, um, but the FDA, FDA did vote and um, 17 out of 18, one there was one abstention, um, unanimously voted um, to recommend Pfizer vaccine for ages 5 to 11 for all children. They did not get into the, the question and what they voted on was merely yes or no. It wasn't who, necessarily who it should be for, but the basic recommendation from the, now that, again, this is FDA's advisory committee. FDA still has to make a decision and put forth an issue, an emergency use authorization for this vaccine for this age group. Um, but they did vote um, in support of that. So um, once um, FDA issues their emergency use authorization, um, ACIP is scheduled to meet on November 3rd, um, and they will um, advise on any clinical recommendations around this um, and put forth the recommendation to CDC. So and in preparation um, for this um, vaccine for 5 through 11, um, we have been working diligently to ensure that there is sufficient access um, for parents and guardians to bring their children. So um, some of the access points, so we're working <coughs> with our municipalities. So as we, we've been doing through the, uh, the whole response, um, Alicia and her team in the Center for Emergency Preparedness and Response and others at the department have been working with municipalities and schools to set up clinics. And so we they're re reaching out now and working with the municipality to see who is interested in doing that. Um, we don't have firm numbers today, but they're working diligently. And we know that there are a fair number who are very interested in doing this. Um, and um, there may be some that are not. And for those that are not, we have two vendors that we've been using again throughout the response. Um, CMAC Medical Reserve Corps and the wellness company who can fill in and um, um, you know, be the vaccinator at those school clinics if need be. Um, that's an option. As Kaylin mentioned, we're going to continue working um, with um, clinics within high density communities um, and possibly in school settings and other community settings where it's um, suitable and accessible for parents and guardians to go within that community, making sure that we're bringing vaccine right in to where people are to make it as easy as possible. PrepMod, that's a scheduling tool that we've been using um, for locations that are out in the community. So basically, it's for any location that doesn't have an electronic health record that can report directly to our registry, or some people have been using it just merely for a scheduling system, but that will be continued, um, you know, to be utilized as we work through our 5 to 11. And then the local education agencies um, have been um, promoting events and will be promoting events, working with our communications team um, and then school staff as well. So a lot of engagement with all of the, the schools at that, in, at that local level um, to ensure that they are also providing messaging back out to their community, to their parents, um, encouraging um, their children to be vaccinated. So again, wrapping around all the access, and I'll get to providers in a minute, because we have a whole slide just for providers, um, but they of course are another access point. Um, wrapping around all of this are the communication. So we know that access is important, but making sure that the messaging and um, people know what is out there and where to get it um, the, um, our communications team is working on a multi-channel paid media campaign um, to help support and encourage parents to get their children vaccinated, um, collaborating, collaborating with the Rhode Island Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics um, to engage pediatricians as messengers. We know that um, our uh, medical providers, our pediatricians, family physicians, and others um, are a trusted source of information. Many parents are going to want to hear that and either directly speak to um, their healthcare provider for their children or hear it from their health care provider. Um, it'll, they're going to be holding English and Spanish virtual town halls um, with um, pediatricians and parents, so parents have an opportunity to ask questions, learn more, um, discuss any hesitancy that they have, and, and um, we'll also be distributing um, materials, letters, flyers, um, with support from the Rhode Island Department of Education, um, and then, of course, leveraging um, new and existing research. So doing spot polling, um, monitoring uh, like social media, doing surveys to inform our messaging to make sure that we 
understand what some of the obstacle barriers and hesitancy are um, to help alleviate um, that and get um, the information. <clears throat> so the question I've already gotten from the school that I'm working with, what is, is that should be part of the message in North Miami? What are there going to be the changes in quarantine and isolation requirements if the vaccinated child is exposed? This is a big pain point for our parents. Those are in the class. They have to stay home. And they're, they want to know if that's going to change. Does that may influence? Sure, that's a great question. So if, if, um, if folks on the line had heard that, it's really what is it going to be the impact um, on quarantine and isolation for children that do, uh, do become fully vaccinated or are fully vaccinated. Um, my understanding, and Alicia, correct me if I'm wrong here, but right now um, the recommendations from RIO is if a child, so those who are 12 and older, um, are vaccinated and there is a case within a school or a close contact that if they're fully vaccinated, they don't have to quarantine. Is that right? Yeah, the change is very rapidly, yeah. so, so we're not touching it every day. Yeah, I, I probably should not. <laughs> That's not my my uh, my purview, but I we will take that back. Um, it's, it's documented, and we will bring that to the team um, that works on quarantine isolation. But I agree that that is a a um, a benefit or a carrot um, to being vaccinated. If in fact that is the outcome, is that they don't have to quarantine. Yeah. Very good. And, and, and once we do clarify that, we'll work with communications and that can be a message that's promoted. The Department of Health has been very good about communicating the changes to the school and our teachers, but I think what Dr. Olmack, Barajah, and I are experiencing on the front line is school and our teachers aren't able to keep up with all these changes or they're applying their own individual district's interpretation. Um, and there's still some adversarial conversations between parents and school and our teachers and um, the medical home. So as messaging comes out, being as firm, consistent in every venue, at every time, multiple ways would be really, really helpful um, to try and unify all of us on the same platform of understanding. Thank you. Yes. From our communications folks and others who are still listening in, taking these notes. So thank you. So um, moving in, um, back into access, um, the next slide. Yeah, the provider network. So we've been talking about this for quite some time. I know, at, well, as you all know, we knew eventually that um, child vaccination would happen. Obviously, 12 and older already happened. We've been working um, with uh, all of our medical provider practices for months now, um, working on onboarding them to administer the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, we do fully recognize that there are many practices that they're telling us that they just do not have staffing or the resources to be able to do this. It's a logistical challenge and we respect that. We'll continue to work with them um, to onboard them um, when they're ready, if they ever become ready. Um, but, you know, certainly recognize that it's for some, it's not going to be a possibility. So as of 1025, we have 55 pediatric and family practices that are fully onboarded to administer COVID-19 vaccine. Um, efforts to expand that, of course, continue. And then I just wanted to give you an idea of kind of um, the, the grand scope of um, the pediatric and family offices, which is 134. These are practices that are fully enrolled in our state supplied vaccine program. So they're already administering vaccines. Um, but COVID is a little bit different, right? This is, um, it, this is a bit more challenging. Um, and um, just to reiterate, well, I'm going to get into this a little bit further down the line, but this is a brand new vaccine. So this is not, we're not using the current 12 plus vaccine and just pulling out a, a smaller dose. It's a, it's a completely different formulation, which is a lower dose. Um, and so and it's a 10 dose vial, whereas the current 12 plus is a six dose vial. So as of right now, out of the 134 practices, um, you can see here that about 40% are fully onboarded, 19% are in progress. There's uh, multiple um, steps not intensive, but still steps that have to be done. We have to ensure that the training has been done, that they have adequate storage, that they signed all the paperwork, the COVID provider agreement that CDC requires, things of that nature. And then you can see the remaining are, you know, they, they've kind of started the process, but really no traction. I don't, we don't know that we're going to get them over the finish line. We have some that still have not responded, about 13, and then 24 have flat out said that they're just not interested. 
again, we're not giving up on that, but we have to respect if they don't want to. Dr. Omar? One of, one of the comments I just wanted to make is that I think we would all agree that in our offices, probably most of our patients are vaccinated in the adolescent range, but among those who are not, almost to a T, it's the mother and the father are vaccinated, but the kids are not. And I think the reason that that's happening is because if you go to CVS and get your vaccine, it's either take it or leave it. I mean, they don't have a lot of time to talk to people about it. And I think when the push is to get that to happen, you can probably get the numbers amongst those. But I think we are in a unique position to be able to explain to the parents why that is. So if the rollout is go to CVS and get it, you're going to see the same set of numbers except worse among 5 to 11. But if the real push is to get it through the doctor's office, I think to see a greater uptake on the part of parents who have, you know, somewhat legitimate concerns. And we have to, that's the exact message that we've been pushing is that parents are going to want to have conversations and talk with their pediatrician or family physician um, about the, the parent. And, and we're also thinking that parents may start calling the practice saying, hey, do you have the vaccine? If they say, no, I don't. So we're hoping that the parents might actually kind of influence them to onboard a little bit. There you are. Yeah, good. good. Well, like. um, nationwide. Nationwide, there's a push to um, have a CPT code for just the counseling of the vaccine, whether the vaccine is actually delivered or not. Um, it has been passed in California and New York State, and I know the National AAP is working on it. Um, we talked about it around here, but the Department of Health could help advocate for us um, with OPIC and the payers that a, a counseling code is important because you're right, those phone calls are already happening. They're 15 to 20 minute discussions, um, and they're important discussions to get us to the finish line. Um, but whether we actually deliver the vaccine or not, this vaccine is different, and the counseling code has just as much value uh, for the time that's used for that important work as actually administering the vaccine. Secondly, just looking at this slide, um, I don't know if it's 55 pediatricians and family docs or the 55 pediatric and family physician offices. Um, I think awesome. from a syntax point of view, that clarification, you know, that the word offices might need to be in there. There's 55 pediatricians out of 200 plus sounds like a depressing number, sure. whereas 55 offices out of 65 to 75 offices is a big difference. Yes. So to clarify and thank you, we will um, make sure that we change that verbiage. It is offices. Yeah. Dr. <laughs> so um, the job interview you're not supposed to talk about money first, but it's time to talk about money. It's a lot harder to put a needle in the arm of a six-year-old who's screaming. Uh, than it is a senior citizen who sits still. Um, I think it's important for the Department of Health um, to make sure that HHS applies Medicare parity for vaccine administration of COVID vaccine <clears throat> across the state. There's been preliminary discussions about it, but those of us who have large Medicaid populations will not be able to afford to do this with the staffing issues if Medicaid suddenly decides that they're going to apply to discount against Medicare. And, off, and this is also an issue of equity because if we want to get into those communities with uh, you know, additionally um, more access to care, um, we'll say that um, well, there's a lot of people listening on the phone, but it, it just has to be that way. This is going Thank you. Yes, we would definitely take back um, the CPT code and the parity um, for Dr. Asiana. Just to go back to talking about the pharmacies and their, their um, access, do we have any confirmation with regard to the pharmacies with how, what's the lowest age that they, that they will vaccinate? So um, we have spoken with um, all of the uh, with CVS and Walgreens, as well as the independent pharmacies, and they're all willing to vaccinate at least down to age five. Um, they can vaccinate down to age three under the PrEP Act that's in place. But as of right now, our understanding is that all the pharmacies um, are willing um, to vaccinate down to age five, and, and many of them are prepared to um, for this age group. I spoke to a pharmacist two days ago who was vaccinated and he thought in excess of 5,000 people on the adult side, he is absolutely scared to death about to his kids. And he asked, where can I get training? How am I going to do it? And I tried to talk him through it a little bit, but uh, I, I don't think it's going to be a very smooth transition into that age group. We, I, we did hear, at least um, from one pharmacist that said that, you know, they're hearing that there's some apprehension um, and again, 
you know, we're, we're going by what the pharmacies tell us. So um, Walgreens and CVS are getting that with their vaccines with federal um, pharmacy partnerships that we're not supplying the vaccine kind of similar to what we did to the adult um, population. But as far as the independent pharmacies and um, Walmart and Stop and Shop pharmacies, they will be getting their vaccine from us. I can't say that every single pharmacy is going to vaccinate um, down to age five. Um, and we have heard that there is some apprehension um, around that. And so we are providing training materials. Pfizer and CDC um, have, have um, putting out training materials to help um, recognizing that this population is very different. Um, there are many more nuances with a child um, than there are with an adult. And so we're doing our best to get out any training materials that may help them make that decision, but ultimately it's gonna be up to them to decide whether they feel comfortable. I Tom Bledsoe from the adult primary care side, internal medicine practice. Um, two aspects of this: one is the onboarding, and two is the actually administration. It took us four to six weeks to get things, the paperwork and stuff, in place to to give out COVID vaccines in our office. So whatever can be done to expedite and simplify that process. As far as giving the vaccine, they're flying off the shelf. Yeah. We have so many patients who come in and say, oh, you can get the booster here? Sure, I'll get it. And even lots of people now, oh, you can get my first shot here? Let's do it. I almost had a triple play yesterday of a COVID vaccine, a flu vaccine, and a shingles. <laughs> 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 I went down on the shingles. <laughs> <laughs> so the that 40% that don't think they can do it, they need, need help. Uh, so Lots of us who are doing it and can, can, uh, can uh, advocate. That's fantastic, and I know the team would be thrilled, um, certainly. So they may be contacting you. Um, that, that is great. And we, the, I know that the team did work on the streamlining. Um, I think in the early stages, um, possibly around the time when your practice did it, the paperwork did, was a bit overwhelming, and they really started to um, take a look at that and what, what can we carve out, what, what can we do to make this a bit easier. So that has happened, and they're trying to get that message across because I think. If they talk to anyone early on, it might be, oh, it was this arduous process, and um, but we're really trying to get that message out that it is not that difficult. And if you just keep a couple of vials, you know, even even if you, you're not quite sure what your uptake might be, you don't know who, you know, necessarily who's already been vaccinated, or just have a couple of vials. And the other thing, and we'll get into this, um, it might be the next one about this particular new vaccine, and um, the storage capacity has increased. How long you can have it in the refrigerator, which is fantastic. Um, so there are many things that are changing um, to help support providers so that they don't feel so overwhelmed. So we will work really hard to make sure that we're getting that message. Our staff is doing all these other vaccines, but it's just another vaccine. It's not, yeah. it's not that complicated. So they need to double check how much. And... Right, right, exactly. Exactly. Thank you for that. Um, Karen Shima. So I, uh, do we know if we have CPT codes for the adult um, discussion about COVID vaccines? There is one, and yeah. we've been using it. I'm okay. not sure what happens when we send it in. <laughs> well, I think that's important to know because we're having, I mean, I'm, every single patient now is asking, like, I have to make, have discussions about what booster to take, and so I think it's important for We will, um, I, I'll follow up with that. I will, um, I know we've got that down, but we'll follow up with OHIC okay, to find out if, in fact, that is a viable code. Yeah, um, one thing that may be helpful is if, if um, you guys have the ability to designate a pediatric friendly vaccination site like we did for the respiratory clinic. Because um, I know just like as a parent taking my child to get labs at a place that should be able to draw labs for the pediatric patient, it doesn't happen. Um, and so that can be a source of frustration for the parent. Um, so, you know, like the school clinics would be fantastic. And if you know, like a certain CVS will always vaccinate a five year old, that's useful for pediatricians to have. Okay, that's great. Yes, absolutely. We will do that. Thank you for the suggestion. Dr. Hyde? Um, so, this is the ACIP. How soon will that vaccine be distributed? Great question. Let's move on to that. <laughs> so, moving on to the next slide, and we will address that question. Um, so I'm going to do a quick overview of the difference of the two vaccines, and then we're going to get into the timeline of um, distribution of the vaccine. So um, as you can see here, so the current vaccine is the purple cap. That's the 12 plus Pfizer vaccine. This vaccine for um, 5 through 11 is the orange cap. 
So the difference here is that it's a 10 microgram, microgram as opposed to a 30 microgram dose. Um, the injection volume is 0.2 ml as opposed to 0.3. Um, the, the, the fill volume and then the diluent that's needed, so it's still a, a, um, a diluent vaccine. Doses per vial, as I mentioned, was 10 as opposed to 6. Um, and again, the ultra low cold freezer, um, you, got, you all don't um, we'll have to worry about that. We, you know, through our redistribution, we have ultra low cold freezer, so when we receive the vaccine from CDC, we're able to keep it in there and it's um, good for six months, which is fantastic because we don't have to worry so much about. Um, it's going bad um, in our warehouse, if you will, um, but it cannot be stored in the freezer, in the standard freezer temperature. The current 12 plus vaccine can be, that's um, up to two weeks, but this vaccine, 5 to 11, cannot be stored in the freezer. It can be stored in the refrigerator for up to 10 weeks. That's a change from the one month for the 12 plus. So the storage, you know, that's that's so much that's much better. I know the Tendo file is as much better because if you have a file and you know you are using this vaccine as part of your normal process of when kids come in, you may have one kid um, in a week um, that might be vaccinated, and that vial. So as of right now, once you puncture the vial, it's good for six hours. However, Pfizer has petitioned it to the FDA um, with information where it can be um, viable up to 12 hours. <clears throat> Say that again. Once you puncture the vial, as it stands right now, this may change um, once we get the emergency use authorization. Once you puncture it, you have to use whatever is in that vial within six hours. So even though the, the vial can be refrigerated for a month or 10 weeks, mm -hmm. Once you've opened a vial, if it's not gone by the end of the day, toss it. You got it. And those vials, right? Exactly. Exactly. So there's always concern of waste. However, and we do, don't get me wrong, we don't want to waste vaccines. However, we do want as many children um, and adolescents vaccinated as possible. And so if waste occurs, it occurs. We would rather have one or two children vaccinated than you worrying about puncturing that vial and potentially wasting eight doses. Addition from six hours to 12 hours for both formulations? Is, that is there guidance on, sorry, Justin Burke, thank you. Um, is there guidance on what the threshold is for wasting doses? For your, just as an example, like, will you, is the recommendation to puncture a vial for one kid? Yes. Yeah. And toss the vial? Yes. Yeah. So we had put out um, initially, I think it was, you know, to recommend to not waste. 30% of whatever you order. I think we put that out. I don't know how many months ago it was, um, but really we're saying, and I'm trying to remember if, um, I don't know if Megan is on the phone or not, if we end up sending out a message following up on the way she's saying that, just exactly what you said. If it means getting one child vaccinated, then vaccinate that one child and waste the rest. Yeah. And CDC recognizes that as well. They, they, are, they fully understand that there may, there's going to be a level of increased waste due to this. That being said, when you look at the national waste and you also look at Rhode Island's waste, it is far below what I think anybody anticipated. Um, every, people are doing such a fantastic job with this. And um, when you look at the millions of doses that are going out and you look at, at those waste numbers, it's minimal. So there's really no concern at this point. Um, so the other thing, can you just dismiss? Um, oh, I don't know. Oh, Erin, if you can dismiss. Um, What's on there, but so training um, will be made available. As a matter of fact, the provider advisory went out, I think it was yesterday, the day before, with a list of training. So Pfizer is providing um, ongoing training. I think they're almost every other day, if you will, um, on training specifically for the 5 to 11 vaccine. Um, and then CDC also just provided us with some materials, um, and they will be updating them to add younger children to them, and those will be going out to providers as well. So hopefully, if you, if you didn't receive the provider advisory, please let me know, and I can forward it on to you, um, and then make sure I'll, that you're that you get put on that list if you're not receiving it already. Um, the other thing is, oh, the shipping container that when you get the vaccine when it arrives, you cannot use that that for storage. With the previous vaccine, when that shipper came, if you if you when you received it, you could use it for storage, but for this shipper, you cannot. It's not made for that. So once you receive the vaccine, you put it right into the refrigerator. 
Oh, one other thing, um, this, the, the difference between the two vaccines, and this was discussed, um, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, the question came up. If you have a child who comes in and they're 11 plus, they receive the first dose of the 5 through 11 vaccine and they turn 12 before they're due for their second dose, you give them the 12 plus vaccine. So it's an age indication. We'll make sure that all of this is without <laughs> all these nuances. But to your point, Dr. Omak, I mean, there's a lot to it, right? Right. Um, so the next slide, please. So here are the key milestones, and this addresses um, your questions, Dr. Fernandez. So um, uh, CDC has provided um, all states and jurisdictions the ability to pre-order, if you will, um, vaccine that was allocated. So every state was allocated a certain amount of vaccine for this, this first ordering block um, of this vaccine. And they basically looked at our childhood population, our 5 to 11 population. And for Rhode Island, it's about 80,000 children. So they allocated um, Rhode Island 27,000 doses, and there were three waves of ordering. So um, wave one was on 10:22, wave two was on 10:24, and then wave three was yesterday on 10:26. You can order up to the 27,000 doses, and then they will distribute that vaccine once the EUA is issued. So their plan is once FDA announces the emergency use. They will start distributing and they'll do it by the wave. So you'll kind of get your vaccine incrementally. There is a potential where wave two could come with wave one. They kind of laid that groundwork. But what they did is they kind of said wave one will come one to five days after the EUA, wave two, three to seven days after the EUA, and wave three, five to nine. But there's a possibility that they could come a little bit quicker, especially for Little Rhode Island. We don't have that much vaccine when you compare some of the other states. Um, and the idea there was that the vaccine could start being distributed in hopes that it would arise by the time CDC meets on November 2nd and 3rd and so that it, you know we can start redistributing that vaccine or administering that vaccine um, you know quicker rather you know rather than having to wait until ACIP and the starting distribution. So one of the things I do caveat is that even though we'll have the vaccine in state or some at least a good amount of that vaccine in state and we can redistribute it, we still have to make sure that our systems and our consent forms and our screening questions are appropriately updated for providers before administration starts. And much as we, we, we prime it, right? We try to get an idea from FDA and from what we know to create those screening questions. But we know that when ACIP meets, there's a potential where they may have special clinical considerations that we have to add to the screening questions. So we have it primed and ready to go. We have a team that literally is sitting there waiting for ACIP to to drop the information or for CDC to drop the information, and then we get everything updated, and then we have to translate. We have to send out for translation. So it might be a, a day or two where we need to make sure that our systems and all of our processes are in place and ready to go. Um, but we are, um, these are the dates that we're tracking. So viably, we could, you know, our um, provider community can start vaccinating potentially, you know, by this November 8th. I don't want to, you know, again, that's just a planning date. It could be a little before, it could be a little after, but that's kind of the idea. Um, oh, and then, um, so as far as the municipal clinics go, um, the team is, again, working with all of the, um, the localities to identify if they're willing to schedule a clinic and when they would um, be interested to schedule two clinics. There's a potential that those could start um, the week of November 8th. Um, and then, again, all of the community events will start to be held with the town halls, with the pediatricians, um, as the, the messengers. Um, as we're trying to promote the vaccine um, for this. So those are the key milestones. So I wanted to, so hearing all of this, are there any other considerations that we should be thinking about, your feedback, your observations, any other than all the other great suggestions you've already provided? Dr. Adiana? Uh, just an observation, maybe just to make sure I see it. The, the first lap around this 10 months ago, and we started with a fairly centralized distribution program I think that I think the state sort of realized that there was a lot of vaccine moving around the state that wasn't getting out as quickly as you wanted it. Are we still sticking to a more direct shipping distribution or are we pulling back to more centralized? So this one? thank you for asking that question because one of the things that I didn't mention is, um, so we do still have um, a, a large amount of redistribution. So much of the vaccine is coming into the state warehouse. 
and then um, providers out in the community, whether it's a provider office or the clinics or um, an independent pharmacy, are ordering this through the state, and then we um, get the vaccine. We have, we have courier services that bring that vaccine out. Um, because of the large sizes still of the Pfizer 12 Plus and then the Moderna and the J&J &J in terms of ordering, um, we still do redistribution. For the Pfizer 5 through 11, these first, with the first wave that I mentioned, those first three waves in that one block of ordering, the minimum dose um, order is 300. That's still too large for many of our primary care practices to take 300 doses. So we will be doing redistribution. However, we do have a few locations. Um, I think Thunderman, Hasbro, and possibly PCHA, I can't remember, um, is getting a direct ship of 300, that initial 300 doses because they felt like they could, because they were able to then redistribute that within their organization. Um, because like, like you, did you didn't, you didn't, okay. Um, so I think Thunder Myth and at least Hasbro to getting direct ship. So it depends on the location and if they can take that minimum order. Now, the next set of ordering that's going to occur for 5 through 11, the minimum order is going to drop to 100. So CDC and the manufacturers recognize that redistrib that continued redistribution long term is, you know, it's expensive. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of money to continue that. And so they're working really hard to get the minimum dose order down. But as you can imagine, in terms of the cost of getting vaccine out, that they were doing large bulk, um, you know, deliveries because, um, you know, it's, it's a lot to, to, to send out a small amount of vaccine to all of these various locations. Um, but to get the Pfizer 5 to 11 down to a minimum of 100 doses was pretty, we're pretty happy to hear that. Um, and they're continuing to, to work on that. So our hope is that at some point relatively soon, we can start having more direct orders and won't have to do redistribution quite as much that's kind of what we're working towards, but it's all going to depend on the pharmaceutical company and working with CDC to minimize how much comes out in a minimum order. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. No? So, Joan so is there a region of the state that isn't really covered by the practices that were noted before that are participating? And I know, I think going back to your comment about where parents feel comfortable bringing their kids, I just think about the Aquinnick Island group that I'm a part of that um, I think oftentimes, you know, feel, feel like an island yeah. um, and just, you know, trying to help them rally if there is a gap. Yeah. So we can get the word out to folks there if there's a need, but sure. I just didn't know if you had regions that you're worried about. They've been, our team has been looking at that to see where um, all of it, so not only the practices, but pharmacies, independent pharmacies, kind of like that scan. It doesn't appear to have gaps, however, they're continuing to watch that. I believe a clinic, um, pediatric, I think that they're um, in the process of onboarding. Okay. Um, I, at least I thought I heard that. Um, but you're, you're right, that they're kind of looking at that to say, is there a desert? Is there, is there you know, for the 5 to 11 population? Um, but it's a great call out. And, you know, I'll bring that back to the team just to make sure that we don't have any gaps. Um, and if we do have gaps, then working with you all to help um, promote um, the possibility of, of maybe finding some access points within that year. The other thing that we didn't talk about was that we have been um, utilizing different mechanisms with providers to try to, uh, because we understand that not everybody can on board or they may not have it, you know, because they're doing flu vaccination, they might not have enough space in their refrigerator to be able to take on mm -hmm. additional vaccines. So we've really been encouraging pediatricians, especially to, um, if they're not planning to hold clinics within their own offices to um, join their municipal partners and then go to vaccinate at those municipal clinics because they can still have that face-to-face. -face. There's that familiarity of the clinician um, in that space as well. So if they, you know, advertise to their patients, you know, I'm going to be at such and such elementary school on this day doing vaccination, or my, you know, my team is going to be there, then people may be, you know, encouraged to take advantage of that opportunity because they still get to see their clinician. Um, as opposed to, you know, having only the office opportunity or not knowing who's vaccinating at the school. Good morning. Uh, this is Pastor Chris. I just want to follow up with a question that was asked earlier on about uh, uh, Walgreens and the rest of the uh, pharmacy that may be apprehensive in, treated in vaccinating this population. And because this is a very special population, when we bring the vaccination to municipal uh, clinics, are there going to be some support to this municipal clinic to help alleviate the fears that may arise as a result of this population coming into this clinic? 
because as a parent bringing it, my child to the uh, pediatrician office is going to be different <clears throat> bringing that child to a municipal clinic uh, just because of the nature of uh, this peculiar population that we're going to be vaccinating. Um, we all heard earlier on that children sometimes are to put the needle on their arm. And so do we anticipate that there will be some concern at the municipal clinics and what type of support do we have or maybe some training to the vaccinators to be comfortable vaccinating uh, this population? Sure. So part of the state's medical emergency distribution system plan, which has been in place for about 15 years, is to ensure that we're, that the municipalities are prepared for kids as well. So there are, um, uh, you know, toys, games, you know, coloring books, and all kinds of other things that they have as part of their um, as part of their strategy to ensure that they have folks. We know that many of the municipalities recruit partners from daycares and other locations who will cater to young children to ensure that they have, um, you know, areas to again entice kids. We, you know, we've done stickers and all kinds of other stuff. We have fidget spinners as um, for some, some of you may love and some of you may hate as, as you know, as incentives, um, you know, as kids are getting, you know, to give them something to do with their hands as they're getting vaccinated. Um, so we've really tried to keep an eye, you know, to that and to re-engage in some of that planning that we've, that we've had for other, um, diseases and, and outbreaks so that we are, um, that we're prepared for that. As you can imagine, this is not our first go around with kids either. You know, we did school-based vaccination exclusively for kids in this age group during H1N1. Um, to, to allow pediatricians the opportunity to focus on kids who were you know, six months to five years because all of that vaccine kind of came out um, at the same time. So, um, so again, we're just trying to engage the right partners and not put it all on the municipalities themselves and the same group of people who've been doing the vaccination. I think to Dr. Bledsoe's point, you know, they've had a lot of training. This is, this is going to be, I think, the fifth go round of clinics for municipalities and they've done two or three, you know, for each of the previous groups. So their flow, their paperwork, you know, all of those elements are now, um, you know, really well-oiled machines. And now they have the opportunity to you know, sort of build upon that and focus their attention because they have muscle memory to do the rest of it. So I think that that will also work to our advantage. So um, we, we will just continue to encourage them. We're taking their feedback. I know there was just a call with them yesterday um, to discuss what their concerns are. And to Trisha's point, there are a lot of resources that are coming out about vaccinating children specifically so that they can ensure that their teens feel comfortable. Um, and again, I'm sure they will be nervous the first day. And as we anticipate, but I mean, we've seen during H1N1, we saw really amazing things um, at the school-based clinics. I mean, just some really innovative um, processes. And they're taking place in schools in partnership with the schools. So we have school nurse teachers, we have school administrators, we have teachers who are involved in that process. And they know these kids and they know their family. So, you know, that's always very, very helpful because again, there's that element of trust and they're entering an environment where their kids go, um, which we think is also very important. We try to encourage them to use elementary schools for this process. Things are right sized for kids, things are familiar to kids, and that helps lessen the stress of, you know, walking in to get a shot. I think um, we went a little over, but we did start a little bit late, but I, I do appreciate everybody's everybody's time. I know we're all very busy. Um, so um, any last parting thoughts? Um, reporting of adverse events, you know, is that part of the training as well? Absolutely. That is, yes, that is always a part of the training. Yep, that is a, a requirement um, and um, any, any adverse event or administration error must be reported um, to theirs, absolutely. Okay. We'll continue to um, we'll work on, thank you for all of your suggestions. Um, we'll work those through um, with our team and then we'll continue to um, communicate with you all. Um, keep an eye out for the provider advisories of when we get the official authorization from ACIP. And once again, thank you all so much for your time and your expertise to help us um, ensure vaccination among our next Group 511.